I have just started the recording of this open meeting in compliance with CMS. For the record, prior to doing so, I announced that Palmetto GBA would make an audio recording of the open meeting and consented on behalf of Palmetto GBA. So we have a busy agenda with seven speakers this afternoon with 15-minute presentations. And our first speaker is Dr. Aaron Farberg, who is an adjunct clinical assistant professor in the Division of Dermatology and the Department of Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at UNT Health Science Center. He is also the Chief Medical Officer at Bayer Dermatology in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Farberg, please feel free to share your presentation. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm actually on my phone, so I hope everyone is able to, uh, they have the printed out deck version, correct? So I can just go by the slide numbers? Is that we, true? We could probably, yeah, we could probably share this for you on our end. Just maybe give okay. us a second. That would be great. Uh, thank you so much. I guess I can start and I'll, um, you know, thank the Palmetto medical directors here for the opportunity uh, to provide these comments. Thank you again for the, the kind introduction. Uh, my perspective has been shaped based on my own clinical research and clinical experience managing patients with high risk uh, cutaneous squamous cell, which I'm going to share with you today. And of note, I have participated in research both independently and collaboratively um, with the company Castle Biosciences, <coughs> for which I have uh, acted as a paid uh, advisor. And I am not conflicted in providing these comments today uh, or participating in today's uh, discussion. So the current draft LCD that non covers uh, the decision DX SCC test, I believe it misses the mark in several areas. And I want to provide my rationale uh, for why I think the 40 GP test has met Medicare's coverage criteria. So when reading the LCD, uh, one of the areas that stood out and really just as incomplete was literature review and uh, it incompletely evaluates or it doesn't even cite several publications that do articulate a consistent management algorithm uh, it, by incorporating the 40 GEP test results into the context of staging information to make specific management change recommendations for our patients. And so the LCD does not connect this, the published clinical validity data to the published clinical utility data. And what I mean by this is that uh, the, there's multiple validation studies that emphasize how the 40 GEP uh, test improves the accuracy of risk stratification together with the staging approaches that, uh, and then the clinical utility studies demonstrate that clinicians are able to actually combine their evaluation of patient specific uh, risk factors together with the GEP results to inform these risk aligned management decisions. So the statement that the LCD uh, states here, you know, it is unclear how GEP results can uh, consistently or accurately be interpreted. Um, it's it's just a result of uh, incomplete evidence review and, and I think unfounded. So slide three, please. So this this next slide continues with uh, additional limitations in the same proposed uh, LCD area section here. Um, in this section, it's it's a brief summary of NCCN guidelines that it just doesn't capture the full range of management considerations uh, for uh, for for patients with high risk squam. Um, a doctor's metastatic risk assessment really just it, it informs a broad range of management changes for these patients uh, with high risk or very high risk uh, factors. There is also some confusion within the draft LCD about the efficacy of specific management strategies uh, on patient outcomes. So the proposed LCD in some places actually characterized the management interventions as completely ineffective uh, to improve health outcomes. And you know, specifically their statements about sentinel node or radiation therapy, they may not improve outcomes, which is really in direct contrast to the broad use of these interventions with our patients. And the fact that these innovations are also covered by you, by Medicare today, um, these, these statements really just conflict directly with other aspects that describe a consensus from academic centers on the use of imaging, <coughs> central node, radiation, follow-up. Uh, the current management strategies outlined um, in the NCCN guidelines are well, firstly, they're aligned to the patient's risk of poor outcomes, including risk of metastasis, and secondly, are included in guidelines based on their ability to improve patient outcomes. 
Next uh, slide, please. So the treatment of patients with high-risk SWAM in the U.S., it occurs at clinical centers and community practices and academic centers. And a critical limitation here is that the LCD focuses on or emphasis exclusively to academic medical practice. Um, and it really hides the full range of risk stratification uh, approaches that we use here in the U.S., um, meaning uh, risk factor based uh, instead of uh, just formal staging. Um, and this sort of minimizes that the unmet clinical need that's here in high risk squamous cells. So uh, more than more than half of this section actually discusses a single survey uh, published by Patel et al of 156 physicians. However, uh, <laughs> the important results of the study are actually admit uh, are, are actually omitted um, from the review. So, you know, the survey is used to establish that most dermatologists or cancer specialists are using staging, and it it omits this very important point that a large number of respondents actually reported they do not use staging systems to help consider whether they're going to do imaging, sentinel node radiation, or other management changes. Next slide, please. So, a published counterpoint uh, to this academic only perspective from Patel uh, can be found in the clinical impact study with uh, which is very similar to uh, Patel's that was not cited or considered in the draft LCD. This is by Dr. Lichman published in 2022. 162 dermatologists who ranked the relative importance of the 40 GEP result with other um, uh, well-known clinical and pathologic risk factors and importantly here the 2B result, the class 2B result, was found to be the most important uh, or impactful risk factor. Now, although the 40 GP was not considered in the uh, Patel paper, uh, there is still clear concordance in the clinical and pathologic risk factors from the Lichman study. In Patel, there was a consensus on individual risk factors for high risk squame, where top ranking factors included perineural invasion, uh, depth of invasion, and immunosuppression. And just as doctors use clinical and these pathological risk factors to evaluate our patients' risk for having a poor outcome, the 40 GEP test result can also be included as one of these risk factors that, afford, uh, that inform our um, risk aligned management. Slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as it relates to clinical utility uh, for the 40 GEP test, it's, it's actually clear from the published literature how the GEP results can and are being used uh, in the context of clinical pathologic risk factors that results in changes in, in, in our patient's management. So the LCD here says, okay, it is unclear how GEP results can be consistently or accurately interpreted, but this statement is really difficult to justify as the answer is readily available in my paper, Harvard et al. Uh, in CMRO um, published in 2020. Um, the, the LCD reviewed this paper but dismisses it as out of date simply uh, based on the fact that it uses um, NCC and high risk instead of the high risk and very high risk. And it's just important to emphasize here that uh, NCC and high risk, it was the current NCCN comparator at the time when this paper was peer reviewed. Um, and I'd just like to say that the three year delay and, and the evaluation of this test shouldn't allow just the dismissal of this utility evidence. Um, also, really, though, the changes in the NCCN guidelines do not negate the clinical utility findings in this range. Really, the only difference is how the NCCN further subdivides, uh, subdivides uh, the, the high risk category and the primary treatment for the high risk tumors uh, originally is the same as the current high risk and very high risk factors. So really this algorithm published in the 2020 paper uh, answers that clinical utility question posed um, quite clearly. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, in addition to consistent clinical utility evidence around this uh, minor shift in the NCC guidelines, there is also consistency in the clinical validity. Um, here, Ibrahim, uh, 2021, there is uh, uh, additional clinical validity analysis that confirm the maintenance of the risk stratification and the independence of the 40 GEP uh, risk prediction um, within both the NCC and high risk and very high risk subsets. And really to summarize these last several slides, there is no basis for uh, failure to 
completely consider the clinical utility findings of uh, the paper Farberg et al. Um, based simply on this minor shift in the NCCN risk groups. So during the time period uh, while this test was under review, by the way, neither AJCC or Brigham and Women's had changed their risk stratification, and, and the, the consistency of the validation data across the course confirms the consistent clinical utility. Next slide, please. So this um, consistency uh, from cl these clinical impact studies and expert panels really demonstrates that the 40 GEP results are interpreted in the context of known risk factors. And these next few slides really point to specific publications where that can be shown definitively here. Um, you've got the figure uh, that I've mentioned before um, from uh, my paper, which really directly answers the Palmetto Medical Director's uh, questions about how the GEP results can be consistently and accurately uh, interpreted. Um, this figure essentially bins various management recommendations from the NCCN guidelines directly and clinically splits them into low, moderate, and high intensity management plans. Next slide, please. Now, there is consistency in this approach in a more recently published study by Dr. Singh at uh, all. Uh, the management algorithm recently published uh, by Singh is similar and is updated to include the new NCCN high risk um, versus very high risk group. <laughs> Next slide, please. So yes, here is another expert panel um, with published recommendations for high risk results um, and they are nearly identical to the preceding two published management algorithms. Again, they will take uh, several management recommendations from our guidelines and match them to the outcomes of the 40 GP to provide the risk aligned treatment plan. Next slide, please. So, <coughs> again, the, the published clinical utility data demonstrates um, the clinical use is consistent with the algorithms and the expert panel recommendations. Um, that they can be interpreted appropriately and consistently. Um, what this uh, means is that for the same patient, that's a Brigham and Women's here, you see T2A, um, SCC, if you get a class one result from the, the test, it's associated with the decreased management intensity and a class two result associated with an increased management uh, intensity. So again, the class result is interpreted in the context of the patient's tumor um, to help inform uh, our management decisions. Next slide, please. So another study that I believe was not maybe entirely or uh, completely reviewed in the proposed LCD is um, here from Hooper. Uh, the LCD cites the real world data uh, from this paper, but it doesn't really discuss the clinical utility aspect of the manuscript. Um, you know, this, this uh, manuscript evaluated both uh, overall management strategy changes as well as specific management changes for six real world cases of patients that were actually tested with the decision the XICC test. And oh, by the way, the management changes here um, from the GEP result uh, and uh, Brigham Women's T stage align with the management algorithm in Farberg et al. Uh, and CMRO. Um, for each case, the impact of the GEP test result changes based on the underlying risk of the case. Um, as it's interpreted uh, within the context of the various clinical pathologic factors that, that are seen in each case. Next slide, please. All right, on this last slide, um, uh, covering uh, specific data reviews for the final LCD, I just wanted to highlight another recent manuscript. It's a final preparation, so it's not out there yet, um, that I was part of coming from the Skin Cancer Prevention Working Group, which is a group of dermatologists who have all spent at least one additional year in fellowship focused entirely on skin cancer. And, you know, this expert panel, it achieves uh, evidence-based consensus statements supporting both the clinical use of the 40 GEP test test. Um, after a structured review of all the published literature, um, both in squamous cell management in general and also uh, it, and recently the developed uh, molecular tests, particularly the 40 GP. And we'll gladly uh, send you this manuscript um, once it's uh, uh, reviewed. Next slide, please. 
And here is my conclusion slide. Um, it's really just highlighting all the main points I already laid out. I'm not going to um, take up your time and being repetitive here, but I do hope that the medical directors can uh, please consider uh, positive coverage as we all continue to try to do what is best for our patients diagnosed with uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. And thank you again for all your time. Thank you, Dr. Farberg. Our next presenter is Dr. Brent Moody from Heritage Medical Associates. Dr. Moody, please feel free to share your presentation. So yeah, thank you for giving me a few minutes. Um, I'm a dermatologist and Mohs micrographic surgeon and dermato-oncologist. I am in a hospital-associated community-based practice, and I practice as part of a multidisciplinary team for high-risk skin cancer patients. And it's myself, two medical oncologists, a surgical oncologist, and a radiation oncologist. And I just want to talk a little bit about our thinking on using this test. And it's something we do use routinely in, in risk stratifying our patients. Um, you know, kind of the, some of the current problems that I see with our current tools that we have to figure out which patients are more or less likely to do well or poorly um, are that our current staging systems, whether it's Brigham and Women's or AJCC, and to some extent, even the new NCCN, um, it has really positive poor predictive value. So we end up putting a lot of patients into a high risk or very high risk category who are going to do well. Um, about 80 to 85 percent of Brigham and Women's T2B patients, which is a high risk patient, never go on to metastasize. So the challenge is to figure out which of these high-risk patients are the ones we really need to worry about and which ones can we safely de-escalate their care. And part of the problem with the predictive value of the staging systems is just the way they're built. And I'm not faulting the people who did it. They're friends of mine, but they just can only do so much. And one of the problems is the risk factors they use are binary. And so for an example, um, perineural invasion is a very important risk factor in both AJCC and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and it treats perineural of 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 identically, even though that's dramatically different risk. Um, in fact, for Brigham and Women's and AJCC, the threshold of actionability is 0.1, so it doesn't even consider perineural invasion of 0 0.9 as being a risk factor when those of us who treat this disease routinely know that that's critically important. So um, again, we've got this non-continuous variables. They're just binary. Um, they also weigh every risk factor the same. So I think if you talk to my colleagues and said, are you more worried about poor differentiation or two centimeters in size? I think we would all say we're much more worried about poor differentiation, despite the fact that the staging systems treat those two risk factors, size greater than two centimeters, and poorly differentiated histology the same. So that, that's part of the reason why our current staging systems don't do a really good job of informing patients who are truly at high risk. And on the other side of the spectrum, they miss patients who are high risk. So of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma patients who go on to metastasize, 30% were, quote, I'm putting air quotes if you can't see me, were low risk by traditional staging at the time of diagnosis. So it, it, the current staging just doesn't do a great job in helping us make clinical decisions for these patients. This is the NCCN staging system. And again, it sort of highlights that factor-based approach, which I think what most people do. Um, I'm a referral based from uh, other dermatologists in the community, and I would say most of the patients who come into our multidisciplinary team come in unstaged. So no one has formally staged them, but they do understand the risk factors. Again, this highlights some of the, the, the non-continuous variable. If you look at the high-risk category, I don't know if you see my pointer or not, but it treats a tumor that's two millimeters in depth, the same as one that's six, meter, six millimeters in depth in that high risk category when when the risk stratification there is dramatically different to be honest two millimeter of depth i don't worry about i see that all day every day six millimeters i worry about a lot or 5.9 i should say whereas is here they're all just lumped into one big category um 
and I think Dr. Farberg mentioned some of this, and part of the struggle we have is we want to, in our approach to these patients, do something that we feel is reproducible and it's reliable. We don't want to just feel like we're making gut instinct-based decisions. Um, so we look to guidelines and the sort of the gold standard guidelines for this disease are the NCCN guidelines. And they're overly broad. They, you know, everything from lymph node palpation to sentinel lymph node biopsy. Well, yeah, how are we going to decide? I mean, that's a huge gulf in thinking about how to treat these patients. And it's saying as simple as how often do I see them? Can I palpate their nodes or do I need to image their nodes? So the guidelines don't really help because they're so broad. And that's because the outcome, even within certain risk categories, is very broad. Thinking about some of the important decisions you have to make, and Dr. Farberg mentioned one of them, and that's adjuvant radiation therapy, which is critically important in the properly selected patient. It's been shown to reduce local regional recurrence, um, but it's a tool we want to use appropriately. It's very cumbersome for patients. It's a lot of trips to the hospital. It's an extremely expensive modality. A full course of this is quite, quite costly. So again, it's an important tool, but we want to use it when it's really going to make a difference. And current staging and guidelines don't really help us as, as much as they could in making that decision. So we're at the point now where GP is really helping our team make that decision, either pushing people into radiation or pulling them out. So this is a real patient from my practice, um, sort of to sort of bring this home into something that I have to deal with every day. I saw an 80-year-old gentleman with a cutaneous SEC on the scalp. Perineural invasion was detected, and it measured 0.11. So it reached that threshold of actionability of both AJCC, Brigham, and Women's, and the NCCN guidelines of 0.1 or greater nerve size. Um, in fact, this is one where NCCN guidelines tell us to consider adjuvant radiation therapy. He was an NCC in very high risk in a Brigham Women's T2B. So, you know, he had surgery, um, which is generally what's done um, in, these disease, in this disease. And then it says, consider multidisciplinary consultation. Well, fortunately, I have that available to me. And it says, consider, you know, radiation. Um, so I had ordered Decision DX in this patient, um, SCC, the 40 GEP test, and he came back as a class one result. Um, and there's been two, actually been three cohorts. I'm just showing you two here. And there's a very wide difference in metastatic uh, risk based on class. So class one has a relatively lower risk of metastatic disease. Class 2B is a huge risk, um, nearly one in two. And then class 2A is in that 20% range of metastatic risk. And you can see what that looks like. If you see the black dot is the baseline risk, just using these little black dots, they're hard to see here. Here, that's the baseline risk just based on traditional staging. And you can see what the risk of metastasis does based on the GEP as well. So favorable genetics greatly reduces the likelihood that patient's going to metastasize, where it's unfavorable. They're much more likely to metastasize. So back to my patient. So for this particular patient, he was 80 years old, still relatively healthy, came with his daughter, and I explained to them that based on the findings at the time of surgery, that adjuvant radiation would be something to consider, and in fact was somewhat recommended by the NCCN guidelines. And the daughter explained to me very nicely that just getting him to see me there today was a challenge. I mean, that was his day. And going to the hospital 25 or 30 times for radiation would be quite a, a, an undertaking for them. They wanted to do it if it was, quote, absolutely necessary, but not if we thought we could avoid it. So I checked GEP on this patient. He came back as a class one. And based on that, in consultation with the patient and his daughter, using a shared decision-making approach, we decided to observe. So we're observing him clinically. We uh, de-escalated his care. And just this one example, I've got tons of these examples I can give you. 
So without the GEP, I would have no way of knowing is this person, that person whose risk is, you know, seven or eight percent or the person whose risk is 20 percent or 50 percent. And so this gave me an objective piece of data that helped me and the family do what we were wanting to do, which was de-escalate care, but make sure we were doing it responsibly and safely. So without this tool, we would not have had that. If you've asked about this tool, you probably would have gotten radiation is, is sort of my thinking, because I just wouldn't have anything else to tell it. Um, and I'm not the only one who's using this. There's lots of studies. I don't know if Dr. Farber mentioned, I mentioned the Lichman paper, so I'm not going to reiterate that. But a lot of my colleagues are using this to help figure out what do we do with these problematic tumors when current staging just doesn't really give us all the answers that we would like. Um, I don't know if this one was mentioned. Oh, this is not one that Dr. Farberg mentioned. Uh, Dr. Sleeby's paper that showed that of people who are um, using GEP, it's one of the more important things they're they're relying on. And I would say that's the case in my practice as well. Uh, looking at this test compared to other approved tests, as far as management change, it's right up there. I mean, the 40 GEP yeah, influences management about 24% of the time, or one in four from this um, Salibi paper. And that's very consistent with other disease states where this test is covered. Um, so sort of my, my final sort of uh, solution or comments here is, you know, I think this just helps because everyone I know is pretty much using a risk-based approach. We do stage these patients because of the type of practice I'm in, but most people aren't. And even with the staging, we really go back to risk factors because we know the staging system has a lot of challenges. Um, and I think Dr. Farberg covered all this, so I'm not going to repeat everything. I just hope you all will think about this because just day in and day out, it's something that my multidisciplinary team uses, and I would hate not to have access to this. So I appreciate you taking uh, your time to hear what I had to say today. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much for your presentation. And I'll so, submit the um, written comments as well as instructed. Yes, thank you. That would be helpful. OK, so our next presenter is Dr. Shlomo Koifman. He is the Associate Professor and Director of Head and Neck and Skin Radiation in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Koifman, please feel free to share your slides. Do we know if he's on the in the meeting? If not, we could skip ahead. OK, we can skip ahead. Um, if Dr. Koifman shows up later in the meeting, we can come back to him. Um, so our next presenter will be Dr. Matthew Goldberg. He is the senior vice president of medical at Castle Biosciences. Dr. Goldberg, um, are you available to share your slides? Um, I am. Can you all hear me here? We can hear you. All right. So thank, thank you all for the opportunity to, to speak here at the, uh, this public meeting. Um, my, my name is Dr. Matthew Goldberg. I'm a board certified dermatologist, dermatopathologist, and I'm senior vice president of medical here at Castle Biosciences, where I'm an employee and stockholder. Uh, my comments this afternoon on behalf of Castle support our assertion that Decision DXSCC Gene Expression Profile Test, or GEP, has met the criteria of medical reasonableness and necessity for Medicare coverage and should be included, therefore, as a covered test in the final policy here for uh, LCD DL39583. The decision DXSCC test addresses limitations of risk stratification approaches that are currently used by skin cancer experts and helps physicians navigate the wide range of management options that are available to all patients who've been diagnosed with high-risk squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC. Risk stratification approaches reliant on the presence or absence of clinical or pathologic factors alone can classify a significant number of patients diagnosed with SCC. And, and at least 30% of patients who go on to experience regional and distant metastasis are actually low stage at initial diagnosis. And on the flip side, not all patients who present initially at, with high stage of disease will go on to experience poor outcomes. Decision DXSCC, therefore, is a clinically validated solution to these known limitations. The draft LCD contains statements that reflect an incomplete understanding for how high-risk SCCs are managed today by skin cancer experts in the U.S. At a high level, the LCD contains multiple inaccuracies that invalidate the conclusions of the draft policy. And these include misconceptions that high-risk SCCs are treated solely in academic settings and misses the fact that patients are also treated in community practices across the U.S. where methods of risk assessment vary widely from practice to practice due to their known limitations and accuracy. 
It's critically important to note that the decision to access the C test should be used with available staging and risk assessment systems and does not replace these systems as suggested in the draft LCD. The proposed LCD also demonstrates misunderstanding of adjuvant radiation therapy or ART, which is indicated for patients who have a high risk of metastasis with a demonstrated improvement in their health outcomes. What's more, ART is currently recommended and considered for a broad range of high-risk SCC tumors, all of which are currently covered by Medicare. The problem is that skin cancer experts don't know, based on clinical and pathologic factors alone, which patients have the highest risk of metastasis and will therefore benefit from ART. So this presentation will focus on the perspective of clinicians treating patients with SCC today with a focus on ART, again, a specific management decision informed by the decision to access SCC test result that has a demonstrated improvement in health outcomes when ART is provided to patients with a high risk of metastasis. Castle Biosciences will submit formal comments that address MoldyX requests for additional clinical validity data during the open comment period. And these do not impact the conclusion that the test is medically reasonable and necessary, and I won't be discussing these in this brief presentation. Just for background, uh, the decision to access CC test was developed and validated to predict metastatic risk for SCC patients with one or more risk factors. This is a 40 gene expression profile test that produces one of three results, class 1, class 2A, and class 2B here on the right. In an independent validation study, uh, the Decision DX SCC test, within a group of 420 patients with squamous cell carcinoma and one or more risk factors, the test identified three discrete risk groups. Uh, and what's been consistent across validation studies, class one results in green are associated with half the risk of metastasis as the overall cohort. The class 2B result in red is associated with nearly three times the risk as the overall cohort. This fold decrease and increase respectively in risk compared to baseline is consistent across validation cohorts and various subset analyses. A multivariable analysis from the same study, Ibrahim et al., demonstrated the statistical independence of the class 2A and class 2B results from the risk factors that are incorporated into staging. Decision DX SCC adds prognostic information that is formally not obtainable from risk factors or staging and can be added to other known risk factors for more complete and accurate assessment of metastatic risk. Continuing that thought, the Decision DX SCC validation studies have shown comparisons to every current clinical and pathologic based risk stratification approach. The Kaplan Meier curves here show how Decision DX SCC stratifies risk with NNCCN high risk and very high risk patient groups adding information to current NCCN risk assessment. In multivariate analyses, with all other staging systems currently used in the United States included, Decision DX SCC provides independent prognostic information. The class 2A and class 2B in each of these three analyses on this slide, they, they are statistically independent of the metastatic risk described in each of the risk stratification approaches. The assertion in the draft LCD that is unclear how the test adds value to clinical and pathologic information is simply unfounded in the face of this published clinical validity data. To unpack further how the test adds information to current risk stratification approaches, this table provides accuracy metrics from the Ibrahim et al. study when decision DXSCC is used in the context of Brigham and Women's staging. Here, the test significantly improves the accuracy and addresses current limitations of staging. For example, all low-stage patients are not truly low risk. The lowest class 1 patients here in the T Brigham and Women's T1 and T2A group on the left have an improved negative predictive value. And all patients classified as class 2 or class 2B here in this T1 and T2A subset are missed by staging. On the other hand, all high-stage patients, the Brigham and Women's T2B on the right, to not actually benefit from higher intensity management and the positive predictive value of the class two result in this patient subset is excellent within Brigham Women's T2B and T2, T2B tumors, representing a marked improvement over the overall positive predictive value in this group. Dr. Cook will go through even more granular validity data in the next presentation. And in, in this way, combining decision DXSCC with existing risk stratification systems like Brigham Women's significantly improves the accuracy of risk prediction for metastasis. To further emphasize this point in the arrow chart on the left that uh, Dr. Moody just showed, which is from the Ibrahim et al. study, the decision DXSCC test provides stratification within the Brigham women's stages. Again, this emphasizes that the published clinical validation of the test is to enhance the accuracy of staging, but does not replace staging approaches. The prospective multicenter clinical utility study from Salibi et al. demonstrates that the decision DXSCC test leads to a change in management in 24% of tested patients, which is comparable to other Medicare-covered molecular tests for cancer patients. Uh, 
And when you focus on ART decisions, specifically the bar graphs on the right, taken from the Hooper et al. clinical utility study, confirm that clinician management changes are not made in a vacuum, as the LCD suggests, but rather in the context of the clinical and pathologic risk factors in each real-world case. This analysis from uh, the Hooper et al. study was not included in the proposed LCD. Switching gears to discuss ART in more detail, on a high level, based on the broad management strategies that are available for high-risk SCC patients, ART is considered as a therapeutic option for all patients in the intended use population for decision DX SCC and is covered by Medicare when ART is provided to those patients. More detail will be provided in written comments, but the cost of ART is significant for every Medicare beneficiary who receives this treatment. ART is also associated with substantial morbidity, and there is need to better identify patients most likely to have their outcomes improved by ART that balances the risk-benefit ratio for each patient. And the ability to inform more risk-aligned ART therapy also unlocks significant cost savings. One study that's not referenced or considered in the LCD from Dr. Ruiz et al. demonstrates that ART is associated with a 50% reduction of poor outcomes in patients with a high risk of regional and distant metastasis. Um, now, this paper essentially demonstrates that adjuvant radiation therapy is, benef is beneficial in patients with elevated metastatic risk, as shown in the three Kaplan-Meier curves here on the slide. However, it also concluded that the benefit of ART is greatest in cohorts with the highest risk of metastasis, seen in the central Kaplan-Meier curve, and that there is need for improved risk stratification in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right, which includes patients within the intended use population for Decision DX SCC. And the study provides evidence that ART directly benefits health outcomes for a subset of patients with a high risk of SCC metastasis. In this slide, the combination of Brigham Women staging and Decision DX SCC test result impacts the predicted metastatic risk and crosses the threshold for clinical actionability for interventions such as ART. Using staging alone, only T2B tumors cross this threshold for ART. Specifically, addition of GEP identifies patients with a class one result who fall below the threshold, here on the left, and patients with a class 2B result who rise above the threshold across all tumor stages. Because Decision DX SCC provides independent risk stratification, the addition of GEP results can identify patient populations that are not found by clinical and pathologic factors alone that have a higher or lower risk of metastasis than would be predicted by their stage alone. Essentially, when using GEP in combination with staging approaches, the Decision DX SCC test result can identify Brigham and Women's T1 and T2A patients who have T2B-like risk, and on the other end of the spectrum can identify Brigham and Women's T2B-like tumors that have risk that's similar similar to a T2A-like uh, risk. Again, this approach is also holds for a, a, a risk stratification approach that relies on NCCN risk factor counts. We look next uh, at the combined validation cohort of 954 patients in a matched control analysis to evaluate Decision DX SCC's ability to identify patients who will benefit from adjuvant radiation therapy. While all of the patients are eligible for consideration of ART based on broad management guidelines, the Decision DX SCC test is able to find the group of patients who will significantly benefit. When looking at the class 2B graph on the right, ART is associated with a marked improvement in metastatic rate as seen by the blue curve on the bottom right. And this aligns with the published literature that ART benefits patients the most when they have an elevated risk of regional and distant metastasis as identified here by the class 2B result. Notably, there's a steep rise in the red curve of metastatic events in this class 2B cohort, which corresponds to the rapid rate of metastasis seen in these patients who are not treated with adjuvant radiation therapy who have this class 2B result. And this highlights the urgency to act on the class 2B result where most metastatic events are seen within the first two years. So putting this ART discussion together, ART is a known costly intervention that is also known to improve patient outcomes when it's directed to patients with the highest risk of metastasis. For high-risk SCC, clinical and pathologic risk factors alone are insufficient to accurately guide ART decision-making, and the Decision DX SCC test provides clinically actionable risk stratification that identifies SCC patients in any stage who can be considered for and who benefit from ART with a class 2B result. In addition, the class 1 result identifies patients who can avoid ART as they are unlikely to benefit, which leads to significant cost savings. It's important to emphasize that the skin cancer experts ordering Decision DX SCC are appropriately using this test for the intended use population. Most clinically tested patients have an average of 2.7 risk factors with a predominance of Brigham and Women's T1 to T2B patients by staging. 
And clinicians are ordering this test in patients where they can make risk-aligned management decisions after surgery, including whether or not to recommend or consider ART and a range of other specific interventions that are outlined in clinical utility studies that have been published. For prognostic tests, clinical utility is demonstrated by improvement in risk stratification that informs treatment modalities that are included in guidelines and are known to impact patient outcomes. This is the standard clearly articulated in other moldy XLCDs for similar prognostic tests in prostate cancer, breast cancer, and bladder cancer, which have positive coverage policies. Decision DXSCC has clearly met this level of evidence from the discussion today and what will follow in our written comments. And in conclusion, the draft LCD should take into consideration how high-risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is currently managed in the U.S. Clinicians treating squamous cell carcinomas are skin cancer experts who are adept at incorporating multiple clinical, pathological, and now genetic risk factors to inform risk-aligned treatment plans. They've demonstrated both in their practice and clinical utility studies that the test results are being used appropriately with staging information to make individual patient management decisions often in shared decision-making models. Decision DXSCC can be used to guide adjuvant radiation therapy decisions that have proven impact on health outcomes for patients for the high risk of regional and distant metastasis, a fact that's not articulated in the proposed LCD. Therefore, improvement in the accuracy of risk stratification for patients with SCC has inherent improvement in patient outcomes as it directs those with a high risk of metastasis to a therapy known to improve outcomes. Further, data presented today confirms the ability of class 2B result to identify patients who benefit from adjuvant radiation therapy. And finally, the broad clinical adoption of decision DX SCC stands in stark contrast to the analysis of evidence presented in the proposed LCD DL39583. Over 3,600 clinicians experienced in treating patients with high-risk SCC have determined decision to XSCC to be medically reasonable and necessary for more than 7,000 patients to inform their management decisions. We therefore urge Palmetto GPA medical directors to revisit the cited literature in the rationale for determination with a more complete review of the evidence regarding ART therapy, including the article discussed today, as well as a more comprehensive review of one of the key clinical validity manuscripts from Ibrahim et al., including the data supplement and a more complete review and discussion of the clinical utility evidence from Hooper et al. to address critiques raised in the proposed LCD. We believe that in so doing, and after review of the comments from Castle Biosciences and other stakeholders, the evidence will support reconsidering the rationale for determination and supports finalizing this LCD with positive coverage for decision DXSCC. Again, I appreciate all of your attention today and the opportunity to provide these comments, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if the medical directors had those today. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um, so please submit your written comments um, through the formal comment process, and we do not provide feedback through this form today. Um, our no problem. Next... Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Robert Cook. Um, he is the Senior Vice President of R&D at C Castle Biosciences. Dr. Cook, are you here to share your presentation? I see him on the roster. Yeah, can Dr. you hear Cook? me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Also, I apologize, it's Shlomo Koifman. I heard that I had missed uh, that roll call, but I'm here. No problem. So Dr. Koifman, we'll put you in at the end. All right, well, um, first and foremost, thank you for the, the opportunity to present our comments about LCD DL39583. Um, my name is Bob Cook. I'm Senior Vice President of Research and Development with Castle Biosciences. As Dr. Goldberg reviewed, um, Decision DXSCC is a prognostic gene expression profile test, or GEP, that can provide independent information about the likelihood of a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma tumor to metastasize either regionally or distantly in patients with a high-risk feature for disease progression, as defined by the NCCN criteria. Um, our, our goal for this presentation is to provide insights about the methods and the statistical approaches used for test validation to, to clarify what we interpret to be inaccuracies in the LCD regarding the performance of Decision DX SEC. Additionally, I'd like to review requests uh, for additional validation per the LCD that support clinical actionability and validation criteria. So the first comment uh, written in the LCD that I'd like to address suggests that the current literature doesn't describe test validation in a patient population with the exclusion criteria proposed by us, Castle Biosciences, the test manufacturer. 
We believe that um, this comment reflects a conversation previously had by Castle Biosciences representatives and Moldex medical directors, during which it was decided that exclusion of tumors characterized by Brigham and Women's uh, staging and T3 staging, uh, those tumors characterized also by lymphovascular invasion or bone invasion. Um, were warranted, given that this, uh, the substantially high risk of developing metastasis for patients with these types of tumors. And I think it's important to note that published validation studies were bef performed before uh, those conversations occurred. But the exclusion of these cases in the largest cohort evaluated to date are captured in the table on the right side, uh, demonstrating strong stratification of risk groups. And within that uh, table, I'll just point out that as a whole, this population of 893 patients had an event rate of 12.3%. And below that, you can see the, the strong separation of risk for the lowest risk group, uh, class one, a 5.5% event rate compared to the highest risk group of 43.2%. The second area of clarification is in regard to the independent prognostic information that's provided by Decision DX. Uh, and these statements in particular, uh, the two statements that you can read here, the first being class 2A and 2B results were more likely to be found in samples from patients with a greater number of risk factors. And then the second statement that the class 2B result is rare and occurs more often, though not exclusively in patients with two or more risk factors who would already likely be classified as higher risk by existing tools. These statements suggest that the alignment with clinical features insubstantiates the prognostic information provided by Decision DX SCC. And um, our argument would be that, in fact, it would be concerning if the validation studies demonstrated a dramatic difference from previously identified and validated risk factors. Significant discordance would um, most likely indicate that one of the prognostic factors was incorrect. And instead of concordance, the appropriate measure would be statistical independence of the risk prediction systems or factors, um, meaning that each adds valuable prognostic information. So independence is an important term uh, for consideration within this presentation. Independence is indicated by a significant test impact in multivariable models that combine multiple prognostic factors to predict risk of a recurrence or other event. And so while a class 2B result, for example, may be rare, it has a significant impact on the multivariable models of prognostication, particularly in patient groups like Brigham and Women's Hospital stage T2B, where the class 2B result is, is um, not rare. I'll have other examples of this independence uh, in, in the following slides as well. Along the same lines, another statement written in the LCD that warrants consideration in the context of independent prognostic information is that the majority of patients tested with the 40GP receive a class 1 or class 2A result, which is comparable in regard to the predictive value of the current staging criteria. While the first part of this statement is true, um, the association and the prognostic value added by a class one or two A result is precisely the reason that decision DXSCC um, should be deemed medically reasonable or ne and, and necessary. Class one in particular identifies a very low risk of metastasis in an intent to treat population characterized as having at least one high risk feature. And that's the mark of an elevated baseline of risk uh, of metastasis. So overall, the test doesn't replace staging, as Dr. Goldberg mentioned, but can be used in conjunction to improve risk prediction. Moving on to the next slide and building on that intent to treat population, I'd also like to point out the inaccuracy of the statement that, quote, the majority of class one results were identified in samples with one to two risk factors, confirmative of a low risk of metastasis. 
Again, all of the tested tumors have an elevated baseline risk of metastasis. Without that inherent risk, the tumor is not eligible for testing with decision DXSCC. So the test result is not confirmative of a low risk of metastasis. The multivariate analysis demonstrates that the risk information from a low risk class one result actually adds information to patients with one to two risk factors. And importantly, all of those patients who are eligible for testing are eligible for high intensity management strategies as outlined in the NCCN uh, guidelines. Okay, so uh, slide seven uh, addresses the first analysis that was requested within the LCD and demonstrates that decision DX SCC value in the context of available high risk clinical factors using a multivariable model. So results from the request to modify the multivariable model to include tumor diameter, PNI, uh, uh, perineural invasion of greater than 0.1 millimeter and tumor location are shown in this table on the right hand side of the slide. Columns labeled without GEP indicate that tumor thickness, diameter, differentiation, location on the head and neck, and immunosuppression are all factors associated with a higher risk of metastasis as indicated by the significant p-value of less than 0.05 in the third column there. In the columns labeled with GEP, we've done the same analysis but have now included decision DX SCC in the test result as a variable. While the same clinical factors are continuing to provide prognostic value, both the class 2A and the class 2B results are significant contributors to the multivariable model as well. And importantly, the class 2B result is associated with the highest risk of metastasis over sixfold um, compared to all of the, the other factors that are being evaluated within that model. I think it should also be uh, noted that a patient who is tested due to the presence of one of the clinical factors listed would have their risk multiplied by a factor of either 2.41 if they receive a class 2A result uh, or by a factor of 6.22 if they have a class 2B result. What this means clinically is that the risk of metastasis for a tumor that was tested due to the presence of poor differentiation, for example, uh, and sub subsequently receives a class 2B result, that patient would have a metastasis risk 16 times greater than a tumor with no concerning features. So those are multiplicative uh, when we combine those hazard ratios for each of these factors. Um, I'd like to next demonstrate the risk stratification um, of the decision DX SCC test and within each Brigham and Women's Hospital staging, um, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital stage. In general, the BWH T1 tumors, which we're, uh, we're focusing on in this slide, are thought to have a low risk of metastasis because there's no evidence of the four clinical factors that contribute to BWH staging. And those factors are the diameter greater uh, than or equal to two millimeters, poor differentiation, invasion below the subcutaneous fat, and perineural invasion. And of course, these are factors that were mentioned earlier by Dr. Moody and Dr. Farberg. Um, in this particular population of 200 patients reported in Ibrahim et al. who had T1 tumors, 19 patients had a recurrence or metastasis. And on the, the top line of this table, you can see that that reflects an NPV of 91% and an event rate of 9.5% overall throughout this T1 cohort. Now layering the results from decision DX SCC testing on top of BWH staging allows clinicians to identify a low risk class one group with a metastasis rate of only 3.3% compared to class 2A and 2B rates of 18.2% and 44.4%. These are significant adjustments for a cohort that would be deemed low risk according to the BWH staging system. 
And I think it's also important to point out the uh, the improvement in NPV to 96% when including GEP results. Moving forward and thinking about the Brigham and Women staging T2A tumors, uh, similar evaluation of these T2A and T2B tumors also re uh, reflects that important risk stratification following GEP testing. T2A tumors have an elevated risk within the context of BWH staging because they're characterized by one of the risk factors that I listed earlier. Within this cohort, the overall event rate is 15.2%. Adding Decision DX SCC test results uh, in this scenario provides risk stratification to identify class 1 patients with an event rate of 9.3% compared to class 2A and class 2B patients with significantly different event rates of 22% and 42.9% uh, respectively. So a class one result identifies patients with a metastasis profile similar to that of a BWH stage T1 patient. And a class 2B result identifies patients with a metastasis profile that's higher than that of a BWH stage T2B tumor. And then finally, the same risk stratification is observed when adding decision DX SCC uh, results to a Brigham and Women's stage T2B clinical result. In this case, metastasis profiles for patients with an overall event rate of 32.6% can be further refined to identify three populations with significantly different metastasis rates. Again, the class one patient has a low risk profile here with a 16.7% event rate. Uh, that's compared to class 2A and 2B patients who with a 34.8% or 80% um, risk profile warrant intensified management protocols to, to monitor for even treat metastatic disease. So in conclusion, um, I've, I've shown results from an expanded multivariable analysis performed as requested in the LCD, and those results demonstrate independent risk prediction by the test. Um, I've also shown that the test results provide meaningful information uh, that identifies levels of risk consistent with higher or lower BWH stages, which is each of uh, each of those are clinically actionable and um, inform the demonstrated clinical utility of the test result. So based on these and other published data, Decision DX SCC we believe meets the standards uh, established for medical reasonableness and necessity and support coverage of the, of the test um, and incorporation to the LCD prior to finalization. So I want to thank you for your uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cook, for your presentation. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Peter Prieto. I believe he's here. Yes, I see him. Um, okay, so Dr. Prieto is um, an Associate Professor of Surgical Oncology, the Associate Program Director of Research, and the Director of the Translational Cancer Biorepository at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Dr. Prieto, you can share your slides. Okay, um, well, thank you. Thank you to the medical directors. Thank you to, for the opportunity to provide my comments uh, on this draft LCD. Um, as mentioned, my name is Peter Prieto. I'm a surgical oncologist. I'm Associate Professor. Professor at the University of Rochester and uh, direct the Translational Cancer Biorepository. Importantly, I treat multiple cancers aside from cutaneous oncology, including soft tissue sarcoma and breast cancer. Um, I am also a um, consultant for CASEL, um, and um, I just would like to start off um, really by, by talking about um, how I've integrated genomic testing with Decision DX um, SCC. Um, I use this assay on a regular basis in my practice, and the tools that it provides, the data it provides us for risk stratification that include really careful evaluation of both clinical and pathological features and integrating both, uh, including that with genomic testing. Um, based on my clinical experience and independent review, I'm speaking here um, at this open meeting because I disagree um, with the proposed LCD um, DL39583. Um, the published analytic validity 
clinical validity and clinical utility data supporting uh, the 40 GEP meets the Medicare standard for, for what uh, is medically reasonable and necessary. And I will spend my time discussing uh, my perspective, uh, reviewing my clinical workflow um, for risk stratification and review a, a case from my clinical practice. Um, as mentioned earlier, I treat not only oncology in the cutaneous realm, but also uh, other epithelial cancers, uh, including breast cancer. And I think what's important to recognize here is that when we compare across disease states in this way, it's clear that when evaluating clinical risk stratification tools such as staging system or prognostic tests such as decision DXSCC, um, we really need to, to, to understand how this improves outcomes um, uh, in, in the terms of patient management. Um, the demonstration of improved outcomes, although is not required for a staging system or test uh, to be proven clinically useful. Um, and this paradigm, again, is seen in other diseases and is clearly stated in the mole DXLCD for similar prognostic tests, such as prostate and breast cancer. Um, so requiring a different level of evidence for cutaneous SCC than is applied to other cancers such as prostate and breast um, really kind of establish a disparity and inequality between disease states. So focusing back on SCC, I think that the standard for clinical utility and risk stratification is set by the clinical and pathologic based risk stratification systems such as the NCCN, the AGCC version 8 and Brigham and Women's that are clearly um, clinically useful, but are based on retrospective data sets, lack demonstrated improvement in patient outcomes, and are not specified by guidelines to inform specific management changes. Rather, these approaches identify broad categories of risk to inform a broad range of management options that I will review today. And as a result, my current management decisions for these patients with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma are informed by the presence or absence of specific risk features and are guide and, 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 and is guided by stage risk assessment with treatment decisions made on um, modality by modality and, and really patient by patient basis in, in the era of personalized uh, cancer care. So um, again, this is well validated for clinical use. Um, this has um, been published um, uh, in multiple validation studies um, demonstrating really um, close to a thousand patients. This slide highlights the the analytic validity demonstrated by decision DXSEC that meets um, CAP and CLIA New York State laboratory standards as well as the robust clinical validity in multiple cohorts showing a clear and statistically significant um, metastasis free survival among the different uh, class assignments. Um, Importantly, um, the validity data from Ibrahim et al. demonstrates that the 40 GEP class 2A and 2B results are independent of all other risk prediction systems used in current clinical practice. And the 40 GEP not only meets or actually exceeds accuracy of other staging systems, but is an independent predictor of metastasis. This is important uh, because it means that we can combine GEP with clinical pathologic staging. And that's the concept of these tests that, that this is the message here, that we're not trying to replace staging. Can we make staging more accurate and help us develop a care plan that is aligned with the patient's true risk? So that combining with staging, this improves the accuracy of risk prediction over other risk assessment approaches. This is the true utility of this test. Um, and, and this is misrepresented in the draft LCD, which seemed to evaluate the clinical validity in the comparison against staging, which is really not the point of the assay. The LCD assumes that there are clearly defined specific management pathways. Close this here. Um, for patients with SCC, when in fact the management decisions exist on a spectrum of inf uh, spectrum informed by risk factors on, on a patient by patient basis. Uh, patient centered decision making is a key component of high quality cancer care, as we all know, and it is acknowledged by the NCC in, in their guidelines and is missing from the draft LCD. Um, the next several slides include examples of the types of decisions that doctors are taking uh, in the care of patients um, 
and, and, and tasks that we need to set in motion after definitive surgery for a patient's SEC, and, and they're influenced by a combination of, again, clinical pathologic and GEP results to inform shared decision making with my patients. So um, if we look at a few examples here, first for follow-up frequency. All patients eligible for this assay, by definition, have high-risk squame. The 40 GEP test patients, if we look at how often a patient should be seen for a clinical follow-up and how this test may influence that, um, there's a very broad suggestion offered that is based on individual risk. We have a decision to make here. Follow-up schedule that is too intense can be expensive and burdensome to both the patient and the system. And a follow-up that's too infrequent could miss early disease and progression where it could be treated most effectively. Now for nodal evaluation and surveillance. Again, all patients eligible for the 40 GEP decision DX SEC test are technically eligible for this range of nodal surveillance evaluation, but again, broad suggestions offered based on individual risk per NCC and guidelines really do not provide for a clear path that aligns with a patient's true risk. It's also clear from other cancer types that when surveillance imaging is targeted to the patient with the highest risk of disease progression that you can identify smaller tumors sooner that have favorable treatment responses. And as a last example, something we use very commonly or sometimes all too commonly in, 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 in the adjuvant setting for cutaneous SCC, and that's radiation therapy. Per NCCN, all eligible patients for 40 GEP test fall into either consider or recommend adjuvant radiotherapy category. However, again, this, there's a broad direction and only from the NCCN guidelines on who to treat. We are not able to treat all patients who can be considered for ART with this modality because perhaps we would treat too many patients. Every patient that's designated as high risk by the NCCN or very high risk, Again, I feel that that would be uh, treating way too many patients. Again, burdensome for the patient and the system. These guidelines rely on physicians' understanding of what the patient's risk is, a regional and distant metastasis, to direct treatment for patients with high-risk SEC. And, 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 and uh, this is actually in, um, in the footnote in, in, in the NCCN. Here is my current... high-risk SCC workflow. It's something we put together over the last few years and I use for my patients. Um, and this is how I combine risk stratification from both the Brigham and Women's staging perspective and utilization of 40 GEP. Across the top of the table are specific management decisions and the rows contain a combination of both Brigham and Women T-stage and 40 GEP test result that established uh, low, moderate, and high relative risk level. The additional level of risk certification allows for identification of patients for escalation and de-escalation of care for patients that would have been either under or over-treated if only using a uh, Brigham and Women's system. The workflow is designed and importantly consistent with the clinical utility studies for um, that we have um, previously published, uh, Farbig et al. in 2020 and Singh et al. in 2023, which again, also contain clinical management algorithms that are, that are not included in the data analysis uh, selection of the draft LCD. Whether a patient is referred for adjuvant radiotherapy, whether a patient is seen in multidisciplinary follow-up or simply seen in uh, dermatologic surveillance, whether a patient undergoes sentinel node biopsy consideration, these are all measures that I think need to be aligned with the patient's true risk and reliance on simply staging or, or GEP alone, I think, does the patient a disservice. It's the combination of both. It's leveraging the power of both that provides a really clear uh, and accurate uh, care plan. So I want to briefly discuss a case from my clinical practice where I was able to actually de-escalate management intensity with a class one test result. That's the lowest risk based on the clinical validity and clinical utility uh, of the assay. In this patient, for example, I utilized the workflow I just reviewed and evaluated the patient's specific clinical and pathologic risk factors in the context of, of his 40 GEP result. 
this was a 68 year old male with a very large fungating central chest mass. It was about four by four centimeters by opsied as a poorly differentiated squame and it extended to every margin. So by traditional staging, this was a Brigham and women's T2B with a risk of metastasis of over 30%, 32.6%. However, we know that not all T2B tumors carry the same risk of progression. And given the low positive predictive value of Brigham and women's staging, we may be over-treating a significant number of patients. So prior to GEP, my initial plan was multidisciplinary tumor board, which we do for all our high-risk squames, preoperative axial imaging by way of CT or PET. I would generally offer this patient a sentinel node biopsy, which adds time, cost, and risk and would refer the patient to radiation oncology for adjuvant therapy uh, in terms of radiotherapy. And, 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 and I would follow this patient probably about two to four times per year. Um, but his decision DX result was class one. So now we have a class 2B patient with a class one result. The new risk of metastasis is now below 20% at 18.8 and is nearly a 50% reduction and more similar to a cohort risk for that of a Brigham and Women's T2A patient where I would not typically recommend adjuvant radiotherapy. So now I'm updating his treatment plan accordingly. We did this and, and we decided to pursue this. And this allowed us to have, again, personalized discussion regarding treatment, shared decision-making. The patient underwent wide excision, wound vac, negative margin, split thickness skin graft, and active surveillance at one to two times per year with nodal exam. Since this patient is still at elevated risk of metastasis, because we know that he's lowest risk doesn't mean he's of zero risk, but he is of lowest risk. How do we follow this patient? Well, we continue to see him about one to two times per year. We see him regularly with full exam, but again, we're able to avoid preoperative imaging, sentinel biopsy, and adjuvant radiotherapy that are that were all would be suggested by a T2B patient. So how is the patient done? Well, he remains disease-free at 22 months at the time of the last clinic visit. So in this case, the 40 GEP test helped to de-escalate care by accurately identifying a T2A-like risk in a patient with a Brigham and Women's T2B tumor, and we have been able to safely avoid unnecessarily radiating this patient in the adjuvant setting and, again, uh, capturing really, I think, what is key um, to care in the in, in 21st century, and that is shared decision-making and personalized cancer therapy. Further, the reason that we know we made the right decision is that the 40 GEP result for my patient is that we combine the GEP result with staging information to give the most accurate assessment of the patient's metastatic risk. And I'm able to treat this patient as a patient, again, with a, with a Brigham and Women's T2A-like risk. So I'm confident that because of the superior accuracy metrics of Brigham and Women's plus GEP, as opposed to just Brigham and Women's staging alone, this gives a more accurate assessment of metastatic risk Overtreatment of patients by high risk by stage alone with low positive predictive values is, 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 is one of the current clinical problems for clinicians who manage high risk squame. Not all patients with T2B tumors, like our patient earlier, benefit from high intensity management strategies as implied in the LCD. Though it is covered and routinely performed in these patients, shared decision making for patients with T2B tumors with a low class one result is an evidence based approach informed by published data. And the same approach to risk stratification clearly applies to Brigham and Women's T1 and T2A. So in conclusion, I hope that my comments support the reconsideration of the 40 GEP test and support positive coverage inclusion in the final LCD. Patient management strategies related to follow-up imaging, nodal assessment, adjuvant therapy, et cetera, are all established and are known in and, and are known to impact on outcomes, but unclear who to treat due to low positive predictive value of risk assessment systems that we currently use. These management strategies are informed by individual risk and balanced with cost benefit in a shared decision-making model. Clinicians trained to manage high-risk patients interpret these GEP results in the context of the known risk factors or staging systems, and again, further demonstrating the clinical utility of these assays. De-escalation of therapy in a Brigham Women's T2B is an important given the low positive predictive value and potential for overtreatment. And this same approach can be said for risk stratification that is applied to a Brigham and One's T1 and T2A tumor. The use of the 40 GEP with clinical pathologic factors identifies which patients are most likely to benefit from 
specific management strategies already established for high risk patients that has met the threshold for Medicare reasonableness and necessity. Finally, the 40 GP should be held to the same standard of level of clinical utility evidence as risk as, as present for risk stratification tools in other cancers such as breast and prostate. The LCDs have recognized this and there is precedent and evidence in place for the use of clinical and pathologic risk stratification approaches in cutaneous squam squamous carcinoma. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Prieto, for your presentation. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Ali Khan Somani. Um, Dr. Ali Khan Somani is the Director of Dermatologic Surgery and Cutaneous Oncology. He's also an Assistant Professor in the Department of Dermatology and an Adjunct Assistant Professor of Head and Neck at Indiana University Health. Um, Dr. Somani, will you share your slides? Excellent. So thank you for your time today. Um, you know, I'm going to start by letting you know that my only conflict of interest is, is that my institution has carried out validation and prospective studies where I, ha where I have been the PI. I also, on an ad hoc basis, have been a speaker and consultant for Castle Biosciences. Um, furthermore, I just want to add that I'm not being compensated for my time here today. And I'm here to give my clinical perspective on the gene expression profile test. That, in, in, that helps me better manage my patients. I'm also going to add that I'm also the uh, uh, fellowship ACGME accredited fellowship director for Mohs Micrographic Surgery, and I train fellows. And because I have this privilege of training future dermatologists and Mohs surgeons, it's really imperative that we utilize evidence-based medicine to provide the best care possible to our patients. And in this regard, I believe that the Decision DX SEC test should be covered test under the, the Medicare, and I disagree with the conclusion of the current draft LCD. And I, see, I think that uh, the other speakers have also shown its benefit, and I hope that the big picture for my presentation this afternoon is that um, you will see that patients should have access to test to this test, because when my colleagues and I encounter patients with a potentially dangerous skin cancer, I hope you will appreciate how the test helps us better manage these patients and take care of them uh, based on the biology of their tumors. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as a brief background, I used risk stratification systems in my practice that are based on clinical and pathological factors. And this means that I take stock of the risk factors that every patient has and gauge my patient's risk for poor outcomes based on the presence or absence of these factors. But there are well-known limitations to the accuracy of these systems, and I think that was really shown well with Dr. Prieto's presentation, that results in a significant number, about 35% of patients being understaged and 75% being overstaged, respectively, as seen here in this table. So in the right clinical context, I can reasonably justify using adjuvant radiation therapy for patients with lower stage tumor while questioning the need to aggressively manage every patient who presents with a higher stage tumor. Even though I use a factor-based risk stratification of AJCC and BWH staging, I must consider the full broad range of management decisions for each patient individually. Can you go to the next slide, please? So here are two real-world cases from my published case series. These cases clearly demonstrate the limitations of our current staging system and the types of manage management decisions we offer to patients with high-risk SCC. Both of my patients had poorly differentiated SCC tumors on their left temporal, and both are immunosuppressed transplant recipients. Our staging considers these patients to have low-risk tumors. This simple fact illustrates the limitation of staging. Because in my professional estimation, I did not think that these tumors are both low-risk, and I was most concerned clinically with the gentleman on the left side of the screen. In fact, this patient was presented at multidisciplinary tumor rounds and was formally offered radiation therapy by our treatment, which the patient declined himself. Interestingly, the patient on the right side of the screen underwent a technically straightforward Mohs surgery, and my post most treatment plan did not include adjuvant radiation therapy or a multidisciplinary tumor uh, board uh, presentation. In practice, these two Medicare patients look nearly identical on paper. I could have considered ART in both patients, and in fact, I only offered ART to the patient on the left. 
most surgeons like myself are looking for independent risk stratification to inform specific decisions in patients just like these ones, which the current staging system doesn't completely provide us with. Next slide, please. I won't belabor the statistics on this next several slides, but suffice it to say that the 40 GEP test has been clinically validated in a large cohort of patients with high risk SCC and is statistically independent of the approaches that we use to stratify or stage our patients uh, currently. Whether you use NCC and risk groups or BWH or AJCC, uh, AJCC staging, the 40 GEP test results adds independent prognostic value to what we currently use. Go to the next slide, please. As a most surgeon, I'm particularly interested in the outcomes of patients treated with the effective, with this effective surgical approach. And the independence of the 40 GEP results from staging system continues in this, in the subset of patients who are all treated with most surgery as well. The statistical independence seen in this court highlights the use of 40 GEP to improve the care of our patients who we treat with most surgery by enhancing the accuracy and position of our prognostic assessments. Next slide, please. So it's critical to understand how clinicians integrate results from GEP tests with the staging risk information that we already have for our patients. This slide shows that our current approach to risk stratify patients, whether it be BWH, AGC, AGCC staging, or NCCN, used either in an academic setting like my own or in the community, provides important risk stratification seen with the positive hazard ratio in each column is shown by the gray bars. But when, I, when we add and layer the accuracy of the 40 GEP in the context of the known risk factors of staging or staging of the tumor, which provides a more comprehensive individualized risk assessment by integrating the clinical, pathologic, and gene expression profile results, I can improve the accuracy of my risk assessment as shown in the blue and red bars in each column depending on the results of the gene testing. Next slide. So this slide looks at the data from another perspective. And using likelihood ratios confirms that including 40 gene expression profile test in metastatic risk prediction significantly improves the prognostic accuracy of the AJCC8 and BWH staging systems. This data is important because my colleagues and I never use the test, the gene test results in isolation, but rather in the context of the risk factors or clinical stage of the patient's tumor. So when risk stratification from clinical and pathological factors is used together with the GEP test result, it significantly refines the metastatic risk prediction that we can offer our patients and better informs our management decisions. So let's go to the next slide, please. So going back to my two patients that I showed earlier, who again are both considered low stage by HJCC8 and BWH, However, the GEP test results and clinical outcomes were risk aligned, but the staging results were divergent for these patients. And the patient on the left returned a class one result, and the patient on the right returned class two B result as shown on this table. In my practice, the addition of the independent risk factor, uh, risk information informs specific management decisions uh, uh, and, and, and allows me to change those management decisions and I would have considered recommending ART to the patient on the right and would not have recommended radiation to the patient on the left. This test has allowed me to appropriately refer patients for not only ART, but also for nodal imaging and a multidisciplinary care approach for, for managing the patients. Next slide. So like my cases, when my colleagues have seen similar patients, such as the third real world case from the study highlighted on the slide, the class 2B result would lead to an overall increase in management intensity as shown on the first graph on the bottom left, and specifically an increase in ART consideration is shown on the second graph uh, on the left. I'm oh, sorry, um, yes, on the left, on the right, sorry. This corroborates the approach to risk stratification that I just discussed in my own patients and can be found in the published clinical utility studies from Hooper and colleagues. And I think Dr. Uh, Pierre also referred to that, uh, that study. 
so next slide. So I, I want to conclude with one last clinical challenge that most surgeons face in another area where the validity and utility of the 40 GEP test stands out in my practice. Most surgeons like myself worry that we're missing patients with low stage disease, disease who actually have a significant risk of metastases. Anywhere from 30 to 50% of the eventual metastatic events will come from patients who we initially stage as low risk. So I've been involved with this research and we have found that, that the 40 GEP was able to significantly risk stratify patients with low stage tumors and importantly, identify subsets within this cohort that carry significant risk of metastases. Next slide, please. So this is a, this pie chart here drive this point home because again, 100% of these patients are classified as having low risk tumors by either AJCC or BWH, and yet there are significant number of metastatic events within these groups. The class two results identify 67 to 70% of the metastatic events in this cohort. This is where the clinical validity data leads to clinical utility in my practice. I hope you can appreciate where the GEP test results help us identify patients who have lower risk by staging, but who have significantly higher risk of metastases after integrating their gene expression profile test results. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my, my final slide. So in summary, I think that the known limitations, known limitation of staging and the two cases I presented underscore the need to improve the accuracy of our risk stratification for patients with high risk SCC. Limiting access to this test by failing to cover in the LCD will have a substantial negative impact on the care of Medicare beneficiaries. And I strongly urge you to consider reversal of this draft policy. The 40 GEP test is the only test, I stress that, that helps accurately identify cases that are deemed low risk by staging and, and, and has been validated in multiple courts, including courts treated with most surgery. The test can inform risk aligned decision, such as ART, as in the two cases that I discussed today. The treating clinicians ordering this test are skin cancer experts, and we can integrate in a meaningful way the GEP test results into existing risk assessment to help make better informed decision for our patients. So I wanna again uh, reiterate that this test really allows us in conjunction with what we currently use to properly prognosticate our patients and appropriately treat them and manage them. So I wanna thank you for your time and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samani for your presentation. Um, we have one more presenter. We can go back to Dr. Koifman. Dr. Koifman, are you ready to share your slides? Yes. Okay, great. So Dr. Shlomo Koifman is an associate professor and director of head and neck and skin cancer radiation in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. Okay, so this is in regard to the DL39583 molecular biomarker testing for stratification of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, I've been a little bit in and out over the last uh, hour or so, but I've heard some really, really compelling presentations. So um, I apologize if some of this is repetitive, but as a radiation oncologist, I just wanted to give, um, I guess, my two cents. My my uh, really interesting point just to start out with is when Dr. Samani presented those two cases and the one on the right recurred because he was a, a higher class uh, 2A, 2B. And the previous, the one on the left was a class one. I, I actually, that class one helps me tremendously because in a transplant patient with a poorly differentiated carcinoma, sometimes my patients, my most surgeons will send that to me for an opinion and I don't know what to do. Um, and I, I think both of those cases benefit from having a, a decision DX score. So I just wanted to um, give a few of my thoughts on the draft LCD. Um, I, I believe at this juncture that the draft uh, LCD uh, potentially incorrectly designates the decision DX as not meeting Medicare criteria for medical reasonless and necessity. I know, as you've heard from other practitioners, but I guess representing some radiation oncology community, I and my colleagues, quite a number of us use the test now to help our patients make a shared decision about adjuvant radiation, which is an important one. 
And I think there's a lot of nuance in this disease and the draft LCD kind of mischaracterizes the level of evidence in support of this radish of the clinical pathological risk stratification approaches that are currently available. Um, part of the issue with this disease is that, you know, because squamous cell cancer is so common, yet it's only a small fraction that ends up having adverse outcomes, NCDB and SEER don't invest in tracking their data. And because of that, um, epidemiology is unclear. Um, it just hasn't been organized in clinical trial consortia. I'm, I participate in the NRG committee for head and neck cancer. I, I'm the working group chair for skin cancer, and we are just beginning in our 50 years of research to start thinking about doing randomized trials in this space. It's, it's never been done before. Um, current staging systems and patient management decisions are all based on retrospective data, and the data extant for the 40 GEP basically falls in line with essentially all the other data we use to make all of our decisions. So in order to provide high quality cancer care to our patients based on the available evidence that we have, um, we believe and I believe that while I use all kind of clinical pathologic factors to help risk stratify, augmenting that process by adding genomic data can only can only serve to help inform that decision. And in, in, in a world of imperfect data, we wanna make the best decision we can. In terms of adjuvant radiation specifically, I was kind of shocked that, that the draft LCD basically said adjuvant radiation doesn't have, you know, an established role or efficacy in this disease. It is true there's no phase three data that um, proves that that is the case. But um, I would argue that if I were in a courtroom and withheld radiation from a lot of my patients, I, I could be held accountable for that. And part of the reason is there's a lot of old data, which isn't perfect, but especially newer data in newer cohorts. Um, I'm blessed that the Cleveland Clinic, that I have a, um, a joint partnership with Brigham and Women's Hospital. We have a joint skin cancer research database with probably 15,000 or more tumors. And we've done a lot of joint work together, which is some of the highest quality work in recent years. And while we don't have SEER and NCDB, it probably rivals that. Uh, in terms of its quality, because as opposed to national databases where the, the quality of the data can be quite um, unclear and unverified, all of our data was done and QA'd by our own groups. We published two papers in JAD in the last 12 months, which is basically the, the, um, the most up-to-date data on the utility of adjuvant radiation. And in cutaneous squame, Adjuvant radiation, essentially, I, I remember my Mohs surgeons being somewhat shocked when we got our data and they're like, holy crap, Shlomo, you're right. It does reduce the risk of recurrence by 50%, which we know in breast cancer and rectal cancer and cervical cancer and lung cancer and basically every other epithelial tumor, non-mesenchymal non tumor, radiation tends to reduce the risk of recurrence by about 50 to 70%. And we found exactly that. Um, based on older data, even before our data was published, but augmented by our data, all the major guidelines, American College of Radiology, American Association of Dermatology, ASTRO, NCCN, they all endorse the use of adjuvant radiation in uh, certain categories of high-risk cutaneous squamous cell cancer patients. And all of this is reimbursed by Medicare. And nevertheless, as a, as a person who I've spent my career focused on trying to enhance risk stratification. I think we over-treat a lot of people. I have to, if somebody has a 25% risk of recurrence, that means I'm treating 75% of people for no reason. Um, and there's a lot of morbidity and cost associated with adjuvant radiation. It's a big deal for 90 year olds who live an hour and a half away. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of patients that by the time I meet them, it's too late because we didn't treat them when we should have um, because they had low you know, clinical pathologic stage, and we didn't know how to find that adverse biology, as the previous speaker mentioned. Genomic classifiers are not even novel anymore. I'd say over the last five to 10 years in prostate cancer and breast cancer, they have become indispensable to making um, the most informed decisions for adjuvant therapy. And the fact that Decision DXSEC um, is filling that role is um, is is almost um, 
right on time and it's it doesn't even feel so novel anymore because of how often we use it as a radiation oncologist again i'm a, I'm a head and neck and skin cancer specialist but i i occasionally treat a breast cancer or prostate cancer you can't move in those diseases without genomic classifications uh this was our paper it was it was referenced several times already but just as the person who was helped being involved this was over 500 patients in two very large practices with good QA data. And basically what we showed was overall the risk of recurrence for local regional recurrence for patients who were treated with surgery alone with a negative margin surgery was 15% without adjuvant radiation, 7% with radiation for a relative risk reduction of 50%, which is kind of what we, what exactly what we would expect. However, 15% is a very difficult thing to have a conversation with patients about. If you have a 15% risk, should they, should they not? People don't know what to do with that. If it's less than 10%, they usually don't want it. If it's more than 20%, we usually give it. 15% is a hard place to be. So what we did was we further subdivided patients. We created a very high risk cohort, which was Brigham T3 patients or patients who had um, a um, recurrent disease or greater than six centimeters disease. And all of a sudden you can see that without adjuvant radiation, their risk went to 30% and with adjuvant radiation went down to about 16%. Uh, it's statistically significant benefit and one that helped further subdivide patients. And that allowed the Brigham T2B patients who historically based on older data, I treated all of them because their the historical data said they were, their risk was 20 to 30%. In actual fact, it's not, it's not the case without adjuvant radiation, it's somewhere in the low teens, and with adjuvant radiation, it's in the mid single digits. And this, again, as best as we can using clinical pathologic parameters, this is, I think, the best risk stratification you have in terms of informing adjuvant radiation therapy decisions to date. However, the problem is this still is highly imperfect. Um, it's highly imperfect because even with a 30% risk profile, that means that 70% I may not need to treat. It means that some people that I'm treating, again, even with adjuvant radiation, radiation is not enough for some of these patients. Maybe they need immunotherapy. Maybe they need to be upstaged and put into some of our trials that were investigated in trimodality therapy. And similarly for this cohort, you know, 12%, a lot of these patients now I'm having conversations with, should we go through with treatment? Should we not? It's very unclear what the right way to do this is. This is the kind of um scenario in which genomic classifiers is best suited for similarly another paper we looked at which were brigham t2a t2a patients which were too low risk for this cohort brigham t2a patients historically they rarely fail uh you know they have a low event rate but we looked deeper and what we found was you can break brigham t2a patients into a t2a low and a t2a high and a t2a high where they have almost one and a half risk factors essentially where maybe they have a uh, a two and a half centimeter tumor, but instead of being poorly differentiated, they're moderately differentiated, or they have a poorly differentiated tumor, but it's only 1.8 centimeters, not two centimeters. And what we find was, was that if you're Brigham T2A high, your risk all of a sudden climbs to 8%. And if you have none of those features, you're now down to 2%. So again, this Brigham T2A high patient is a patient that is currently gets referred to me. I see in my practice and I have a very honest conversation about the limitations of what we know in the clinical pathologic sphere. We know that adjuvant radiation is going to reduce the risk by about 50%. Again, this study shows that, and it's in line with every other study we know in most other epithelial tumors. But understanding the risk of the patients is really hard. So this is the reality that we live in, in a biomarker uninformed adjuvant radiation therapy paradigm at the Cleveland Clinic. This is how we make decisions. Um, as of a few years ago, okay? You have you have your surgery, they have some risk factor that just gets them referred to us. And then once referred to us, we basically put them into three buckets. If they are Brigham T3, we believe that they have a high enough risk, it's probably 30%. We offer all of them adjuvant radiation therapy and the relative risk is about 25%. We aim to reduce that to the 10 to 15%. We do not currently offer them adjuvant radiation, adjuvant immunotherapy off trial. Some of them will have adjuvant immunotherapy on a research study that's open here. Sweetie, one second. Um, for the Brigham T1, T2A patients, 
Um, we typically observe them because the risk of occurrence tends to be less than 10%. And in the T2B world, where it's between 10 and 20%, we have a personalized discussion about adjuvant radiation versus watchful waiting, and we make as best a shared decision as we can. This was the reality until a few years ago. Enter uh, Decision DXSCC, and now we have biomarker-informed adjuvant radiation therapy decision-making that is happening at the Cleveland Clinic. Again, we get our referrals. I talk to patients. I tell patients about Decision DXSCC. I have never had a patient that I've offered and said, hey, you know, this thing was not validated in randomized phase three studies. None of Nothing I have to offer you was, uh, but we can get a decision at DXSCC and gain some more information. All of my patients want it. We get it. And then we make sure decision making. In general, for Brigham T1, T2A, even some of these T2A highs, when it comes back Castle 1, patients are reassured, I'm reassured, and we typically observe them and monitor them expectantly. For Brigham T3 patients, we're typically treating them. However, if I have Brigham T2B patients that come back as a Castle 2A, um, we are typically offering them adjuvant radiation therapy. And now my Mohs surgeons are getting decision DXSCC. They're getting patients that were historically in this cohort, a Brigham T1, T2A. They're finding a Brigham T2B patient and they're referring them based solely on their genomic classification. And we are having open and honest conversation with patients and patients want radiation and we are offering it. Um, and now for patients, we have a, a much more nuanced middle bucket where they're Brigham T2B with maybe a Castle 1 or maybe they're Brigham T1 or T2A patients that got a Castle 2A. And we are having personalized discussions where either the clinical pathological parameters five years ago, I would have just said, you have a very high risk, you need radiation. And because they're ca ca Castle 1, I feel that their risk is lower and a lot of them are electing to not get treated which I think is perfectly reasonable based on the current data. Or we have patients with clinical pathologic risk stratification that is quite low, but they have a CASEL 2A and they're sufficiently concerned about an 18 to 20% risk of nodal or distant metastases that they are asking for adjuvant radiation, including comprehensive nodal radiation, which a lot of people would not have offered otherwise, but we do. And we are giving that patients th that therapy, which I think in 2023, while again, imperfect as it's retrospective data, is I think the cutting edge. And I think that's what our patients expect of us and that's what we give. Um, you can see here that based on um, 420 patients in a large study cohort, patients wanna know their CASEL score during shared decision-making. I feel ethically obligated to tell them about the data, even if it's retrospective. I feel ethically obligated to take them through it. And I have yet to have a patient not feel compelled to get it. And I would just argue that the level of evidence that supports incorporating Decision DX SCC into the shared decision making is as good, if not better, than many of the other risk features that go into staging and go into decision making, whether it's tumor diameter, whether it's differentiation, whether it's perineural invasion, whether it's the nerve size, which I don't think is very well evidenced, whether it's invasion beyond the fat, whether they had MOS or not, whether it's the NCC and high risk de a very high risk designation, all of these data sets have been generated with similar or less quality data than Decision DXSCC. So my take home message to um, your group is that I believe that the cutting edge in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma should mirror exactly what has been shown and adopted in NCCN and by Medicare payers in prostate cancer and breast cancer, which is combining a clinical pathologic with genomic risk stratification schemes to enhance our ability to appropriately categorize patients and to better characterize and to and estimate risk and to make adjuvant therapy decisions both with radiation and immunotherapy in that context. I think combining Brigham and women staging and NCC and very high risk staging systems with Decision DX score in 2023 today allows us our best opportunity to make the best physician and patient shared decision making in this space. And why, why should we do this? It's because Decision DX SEC has a comparable level of evidence to anything else. And therefore, I feel that it has met the requirements for medical reasonableness and necessity. 
and then it enables me to make much more informed and nuanced decision with my patients about the utility of adjuvant radiation therapy. Uh, I believe I have patients every single day. I probably have four to five patients a week in my practice that I'm consenting, uh, simulating, having these discussions with. All of them get Decision DX SEC in this cohort. They all want it, and all of them use it. And I will be honest, some patients um, elect to get radiation regardless. Some people are uh, electing not to or to get radiation specifically because of Castle, and I think that's where it should live right now. It is a high enough level of evidence that in this murky world we live in of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, where we don't have big phase three studies to guide us, it is as strong as a piece of evidence of anything else. And I think we as clinicians, my colleagues around the country that I talk to all the time about this, we feel like it's very helpful to us in making decisions and our patients want to know it and they are using it to make decisions and they're doing it in a very rational informed way and because of that i feel that um it has met its criteria and i think it would be a real shame to not allow patients to have this very important piece of information in making this decision if this were my family member this is an acute time for me and family i'm going to go back to them right now um if god forbid it was my family member i would want to know the score i think all of you, if you came to me and my practice and we had an hour long consultation and I told you this thing existed, if it was your brother or your mother or your sister, you'd want to know the score and you'd probably use it in making your decision. And I think that's it's a very important that there's no greater level of appropriateness than that. So I appreciate your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kweifman, for your presentation and thank you to all of our presenters. So this now concludes our open meeting. Please remember to submit your written comments through the formal prompt comment process, and we wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you again.